basketball really changed for me once I realized I was not going to improve and be the player that I saw myself being overnight. Once I realized, like, I really just got to focus on getting better at some every day. And sometimes that was, okay, physically I'm working out today. Tomorrow I'm doing basketball. And so I worked myself up to a point where it was like, okay, we're, we're doing physical work today and two skill workouts. Maybe that's one skill workout. We're going to shoot tonight and weights in between. Maybe a little yoga. Once I realized what worked best for me and I stopped looking around at what my peers is doing and even teammates I, I, I had to realize my body and development path is different from others once I just focused on the mountain that I was climbing up and realizing that I just had to get one percent better literally every day I start to buy into the pain I stopped comparing my journey to other people I think too often we let systems and like linear thinking uh, dictate our destiny like you know I'm constantly seeing people feel like, okay, you have to go to a big program, a big school, uh, you know. We always feel like we need these like, these, these cosigns from these bigger institutions or whatever it is. And I think that's just that systematic programming. Cause I feel like, you know, sometimes imposter syndrome tries to come above me and like the doubt will creep in like, oh, you're 30 years old. Nobody wants to see you play. The NBA only signs people from these big D1s or the same AAU programs. And that might be true. But I feel like <laughs> I've been putting in the same work, paying for trainers, buying online programs, getting the same knowledge as NBA players make millions of dollars. I feel like I'm prepared. I'm doing, I'm putting in the reps and the work. I'm not gonna allow imposter syndrome to count me out now. I feel like my time is now. Um, I've been more than an athlete. Uh, you know, I've tried my hand in entrepreneurship, making mobile apps. Uh, the feet today is growing, and I'm a father. So I know for a fact that it's a lot more I could bring to an NBA team than just running up and down the floor, getting buckets, and playing defense. And I think the NBA and its platform, kids pay attention to the NBA platform. Kids hold on to what somebody like LeBron or Steph Curry says out their mouth. So I think that locker room in the NBA needs guys like me to come in with a differentiated mindset that's focused on community and love. And, and, and the world needs that, you know what I mean? So I, I know for a fact I would be one of those locker room guys, you know, pouring into my teammates, you know, um, and showing them, you know, to, to not lose track of the moment. Like over the last few years, I really had to teach myself how to be present. When you really want to achieve your goals so bad, it can make you so anxious. And you're always looking ahead. But the only way I've been able to work since I got out of college in 2015, I was getting 1% better every day by just being present. That's how the feat today was, was, was started with me and my, one of my close friends. It really just started with us just being on our journey and um, staying in the gym, having that motivation every day to wake up three, four in the morning, get to the gym. When I was thinking about the mountain ahead of me, and, and this is like getting out of school, it used to drive me crazy thinking about all the work and development I had to do. This is before YouTube had so many channels showing you how to get better work in your game. I just had to get out there and figure it out. So like my journey was crazy. Man. I definitely had my dog days, you know, three, four in the morning, getting up, getting the light time, or LA Fitness work, no matter where I'm at, to work on my game, you know, using what I had, being broke, sleeping in the car late nights, because the gym opens early, and you want to get in, get shots up before they have summer programs with kids on the floor. Like, all those elements and roadblocks came my way to try to prevent me from getting better, and for about six, seven years straight, man, if everybody that's around me to know my journey, I haven't cut no corners, man. I've really been working on my game and I wouldn't uh, change my journey and my path for nothing. Well, honestly, with this project, I would like to challenge people. I would really like to challenge people's thinking. Like, why do we feel like, especially in America, that you got to go to this major D1 school and you got to go to the best high school and the best prep school just to play in the NBA? Like, nah. It's everyday people out here 
I mean, technically, I had a desk job last year. I was working remote, working from home. Why am I not qualified for the NBA? I put in work. I've been grinding for, I don't even know how long. I've been grinding for a long, 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 long time. Like, why am I not qualified? Because maybe people can't benefit from me by coming from the Nike or Adidas AAU team and the, the, the best state school, so the money trickles back to their pockets, right? Off of my name, image, likeness, and I get it, but I just think that's why American basketball is falling off. Because in Europe, I remember being in Spain, I'm playing against people who are literally almost 40 years old, working normal jobs at the deli and stuff, working regular jobs, and then they come play pro basketball. Why is it America like that? You mean to tell me that, oh, because you don't go to the best D1 school and you come from the best Nike AAU program, you don't have the heart and the soul and the discipline to qualify to be a professional athlete? You can't put the ball in the hole, you can't guard someone, you can't, you don't have an IQ, you can't play defense. Like, it doesn't make sense. America's basketball system is just all set up on like this capitalistic uh, exploitation of, of, of our youth. And, you know, they convince people, oh, well, you're past, you're almost 30, so you just can't be a pro. You, 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 your time has, you pass your time. According to who? You know what I mean? It's just like in America how you have to go through AAU, then college, to be a pro. Well, there's a guy named Luka Doncic who didn't do any of that. He was playing pro at, what, 16, 17. And look what he's doing. So I think it's just a time that the world embraces differentiation and in a different path like it's okay to see past the systems and group think and you know even myself at 30 now I sometimes have imposter syndrome I'm like yo wait a minute why am I doubting myself now I've done nearly almost the same drills if not more the same strength and conditioning if not more than NBA players I am an NBA player right now I am qualified I just need the opportunity and so you know hopefully the right eyes the right GM the right person out there can understand my story and understand that, you know, I've always been more than an athlete. And because of that, you know, I think I'm ready for this platform because the NBA is, is it's not just about basketball. It's bigger than basketball. And a lot of the teams that seem to win the championships, it's because it's a culture. The Warriors, the Spurs, there's a culture. It's not just about it's not this Kentucky mindset. Let's just get the best players and roll the balls out. Like, no, nah, you need people who will have character. And I'm one of those guys. My character is undefeated. My character outweighs a lot of the 400 plus players out there in the league. And I feel like I deserve the opportunity. I feel like I belong in the NBA. Period. Point one. I think, too, it's like if I was a GM, an owner of a team, like, I would be trying to do almost user research on these players. Like, what's your heart like? Like, I understand your family pushed you through. You had a trainer since you were six, and you were just like, is everyone riding you to the NBA? But, like, does it, do you want to be in the NBA? Because every time I look up, I'm seeing NBA players want to be rappers for real. They want to smoke dope all day and do drugs and be in the club. It's like, I'm seeing guys who really, do you have a mumba mentality? You know what I'm saying? Because... It, it's like, yeah, you could post your workouts on the gram all summer and make it look cool, but is that really you? Is you really a warrior spirit? Is you really a chosen one? Or you just kind of like slide, slid your way into the league? Because I think a lot of the league now, the retention rate isn't the same. Like a lot of guys play on the best AU team, they go to the best school, they get drafted, play a couple years, and then it's just like, because it's like it's not enough time to develop all these people. The no player development program can develop all these young guys so you got this young NBA everyone plays the same everybody got the same trainers the same moves so it's like people aren't even unique anymore like you look at 90s basketball early 2000s you had guys with different bodies different ways of training different ways of getting after it um it was just a more unique game I think now it's just like a you have to be a clone <laughs> you know what I'm saying because the game is now it's a seven second offense you know high pick and roll all right point guard gets it has he move has he's take them or pass it's just like the same formation or you got the dho formation but it's like that doesn't measure the the you know it's hard to a kid that's 
18 through 24 it's hard to say that they've truly lived enough life experience to understand fear to understand faith to understand perseverance that's what i'd be looking at if i was a gm like who are you deeply what am i getting right now what am i signing and i just think i'm one of those guys like real life put me through a lot of real shit real life so this basketball shit is like this shit is this is this saved my life it's been my sanctuary but this shit easy this real life going on out here it's real life people we see what's on the news we see what's been happening how numb and insensitive we are to violence and pain and all these things going on and i just think like like i don't know i just think basketball the product that's out there that the fans see could be a lot better if the team owners and GMs kind of like stop cheating the game a little bit and really, you know, sign more overseas guys, sign more guys that went to NAIAs and D2s that just happen to not have the same resources and whatnot to get the same opportunity as the kids at Kentucky who all play the same. Like last time I forget how many kids came out of Kentucky and how many still in the NBA? Because all I can remember is Anthony Davis, Nerlens Noel, John Wall, like I don't even remember half the people that come out. Devin Booker, um, and I'm not here to ride Kentucky, but I'm just using them as an example. But, uh, you know, every time I'm in the gym working out with guys, NBA guys, young ones, they seem scared to me. They seem like they deal with a lot of fear. It's almost like, like I've been to, I've been to a lot of those combines. They just take your money. Like, like I've been to a lot of those combines. They just take your money. They, those, the exposure camps, the Vegas stuff. I done have my share of shady agents. Like, hey, I can get you a deal, but pay me. God, I've been through the ringer. I done sent film to 300 coaches, and you buy the contact list, and fingers crossed you get an opportunity overseas. Like, I did all that. I've been to G League workouts. I've been to G League camps. Um. I started to get really close on my journey. I would say summer 2019. I spent the entire summer in Texas working out with Sean Dockery. Uh, Cause we was, I, I seen him in San Antonio and I was like, yo, Sean, you used to help my AAU team in Chicago. He, he immediately remembered, he like, oh, I remember you. Uh, obviously Sean Dockery worked with the Spurs. He trains a lot of those guys. He's got his own program down there, DBA Warriors, and you team. Shout out to Sean doing that, doing great things. And I met this guy down there named Marlon. Marlon would have us working out with like Paul McKeskey, who was like, and he has some experience coaching the Kings. Um, Paul McKeskey played in the NBA. Uh, lots of experience. He works with the TBL, which is another league in America. Like Paul McKeskey is a, you know, he a pro. Coach, like, this guy could call a GM right now and give me opportunity. And so he worked us out a lot that summer in Texas. And he was just like, um, you can play in the league. He was like, when? Like, I've noticed his language would change. He would be like, when you get to the NBA, you're going to get used to footwork. I mean, I'm learning stuff. Talk about being a late bloomer. I'm learning stuff that I should have learned as a kid. When you're on the right side of the hoop, you put that ball down, we all know it. Now it should be, you know, you put it down, left, right, or the opposite, right, left. No, I didn't know none of that. So he's, he's giving me the insight, like, when you work out with NBA teams, when you get your opportunity, you want to at least check the basics. You know, when somebody looking at you, some staff, scouts, how you footwork, like? You're like, you're talented, but certain things, footwork, certain stuff, NBA personnel is going to look at you like, Scratch his name off. This guy, he ain't even, you know, he's got the right shoe for it. Dude, this summer 2019, I'm learning this. I was 27 years old. 20, 27 years old. Like, almost like I was getting the icing on the cake. So, like, my dog years were, I didn't really tell people my goal and my desire. It started in college. Like, waking up, going to the gym. That's when I'm, like, building my stamina, building my endurance. I'm just working. Hard, not necessarily smart. I had to bake my own cake. That's the analogy I like to make. I have to, I have to bake my cake. 
Nobody helped you bake that cake. You gotta figure out the recipe. It wasn't until 20, I would say, that 2018, 2018, 2019, where I started to get like calls back from tryouts. I had my first like private workout with the Knicks G League, uh, Westchester. They had like 50 guys coming. It wasn't something that you could pay for off and come off the street. It was like invite only at the Knicks facility in New York, in Westchester. The owner was there, Knicks owner, full the full Knicks staff, the one that you can Google on NBA.com, all that. Like, and that's when I realized, like, being in the gym with kids that came from Kentucky, Louisville, I seen like all the book bags and the big schools they went to, and I'm just like, I'm just this dude that go to tryouts and combines, and I keep my day job. Uh, you know, I've been overseas a couple of times. I'm just a nobody there. That inspired me. That inspired me. A lot of those dudes there, they have this demeanor like, probably because they came from big schools, like, they deserved to be in the NBA. Or, like, they knew they, it was good. Me, I was just like, number one, I'm glad to be here. And number two, I'm soaking up game. I'm asking the staff, yo, what could I do to tweak my shot? What could I do to, for strength and conditioning? Like, same with the go-go workout in D.C. Like, I'm staying late after the, the, the tryout. I'm asking the staff questions. Hey, what could I do for work on my game, right? Um, so I guess being a late bro, man, you know, you learn things late, but my theory is like, I feel like when things are meant for you, it don't matter when you learn it. And it's always on time. So like, going back to like, just Paul McKeskey, Everything he taught me that summer, and Lee Le Lee Nalon, he was a uh, like a lefty Michael Beasley type of guy back in the day. He was an NBA player. He's all right, he was retired. He was there as well. And the gems they were just telling me, it felt like it was just right on time. It felt like it was just the icing on top of my cake. And then COVID came, <laughs> so I was building up all that momentum from 2015 graduating college. Overseas camps, getting opportunities here and there, all the way to 2018-19. After that summer, it comes COVID. So that setback with COVID-19, like the two years that kind of last, I had a daughter during COVID, and to just feel the feeling that your dreams are fleeting away, like you, it I don't know, it felt crazy. I dealt with a lot of fear, a lot of anxiety. A lot of insomnia, and that's when I really got into mindfulness. That's when I really started learning how to meditate. That's when I really had to learn how to, um, you know, visualization techniques and how to breathe. And it, it, I had to really learn how to be present, right? Because now we, new new baby, still had not reached my goal of playing the league. Uh, COVID nineteen, just all these factors of life. And variables hit me out of nowhere, and I'm just like, yo, should I just quit being so ambitious? Like, this is a lot. It's 2022 now, making this video. I got through that period. It made me a better man. It made me a better father. It made me a better athlete. To be honest. <laughs> Okay, Iman, don't shuffle it out here with the bucket. Sidestep. And that's dirty. That's water, baby. He said, what is this, baby? That pass. Iman, don't shuffle with the three from the top of the key. And it's good. That's a bucket right I've been in the gym so much, a lot of people tell me, man, you should have TikToks by now. You should be, you should be an influencer. And I never looked at my player development journey as something that I want to capture every workout and always be on Instagram and stuff. I looked at it like a sacred journey. Like, first off, why do I even want to show people how I'm getting better? You know, even doing this short film, people still don't see every drill and every philosophy I've bought into. And because I feel like some parts of the journey should be sacred. It should be like, you know, this is for me. This is for me to know, or whoever was in the gym that day. We'll remember this. It's not for everybody. And so I would love to see like a level of discretion. It's almost like a level of discretion. Like, 
I think that's what the generation below us, they think like revealing everything is what's going to get them there. It's like, nah, now we competing. I'm trying to kill people. I ain't trying to show you how I'm really getting better. Like, if you show me something, we can exchange. But I don't know, I just take it, I think it take away from the thrill of the fans, like seeing everything. They should be showing up to the games and seeing some gladiators compete. Don't worry about how we got better unless you're trying to come in them hot gyms with us, you know? But this is my opinion, man. I definitely consider myself a late bloomer, like honestly. Like when most people probably was playing basketball on like real teams, organized teams, at, you know, second, third grade, I wasn't doing that. I was the typical kid in the neighborhood going to public school, wearing Dickies school pants, getting holes in my pants, playing at gym, trying to play in the alley. Uh, Mr. Martin, uh, my first basketball coach was Mr. Martin. He passed away. God, uh, God bless his family and, and may his soul rest in peace. Uh, Mr. Martin, he had a hoop in the alley. His son, Ricardo Jr., was my best friend growing up. And I'll never forget, we was in like fourth grade. He said, hey, we hoop every day in my alley. Which is on, his alley is probably like 103rd and Calumet, south, far south side of Chicago. And he was like, yo, we play every day in the alley. Like, you should come through. And I'm like, yo, I don't even know y'all played every day in the alley. I was at my grandma's house with my cousins playing. We would put hangers in the door. We would put a crate up. We was just in the backyard. We had an imaginary hoop. My cousin sometimes would hold his arms out. We would be on the side of the house hooping. Uh, so I wasn't on the team ever. So then that was fourth grade. And Mr. Martin was saying we were going to have a team next year. My elementary school, we didn't even have a team every year. So my development compared to most kids is way behind. Fifth grade was the first time I actually played on a basketball team. Like we had tryouts at Bennett, Bennett Elementary School on Chicago South Side. I'll never forget, cause I sucked. Like I, I, I had the heart, athleticism, I was long. I was like probably like five, eight, five, nine. I wasn't even the tallest. And I had like that slow quickness, like that James Harden slow quickness back then. And I had a left hand layup. Literally, the only reason I made the team, I'll never forget, the gym was like probably like 50 kids. And he had one line for right hand layups, one line for left hand. I was the only person in the gym that day on the side with left hand layups. And I made it look easy. I'm dribbling, I left, right, lay it up. I'm left, right, lay it up every time. So Mr. Martin, like, who taught you how to have a left hand layup? I'm like, nobody. I was always, I always had both hands. Like I was kind of left-handed growing up. I never really switched. So that's the only way I made the team. I couldn't do nothing else. I couldn't shoot. So that was fifth grade. I think by me not being the best in my neighborhood, that put a fuel in me. That's what made me like basketball. It became such a challenge because I wanted to be the best player in my neighborhood. So I would go to my dad's house and find stuff to lift up and squat. And just, you know, this was like before you had better basketball DVDs, before you had YouTube, like you really had to know somebody with a basketball background to get better. I didn't have that. Like I wasn't the kid, eighth grade, everybody knew about him because I was nice and skilled. I was a kid that knew how to play the right way because I watched the NBA. Um, I knew how to play defense. I knew how to get a lot of layups. I had heart and I was just like one of those, I was a gym rat. I would be going to the YMCA. My mom got me a YMCA membership, preparing me for my first high school, which is at De La Salle Institute in Chicago. De La Salle is a powerhouse. I was probably, I had a friend named DJ. He was 6'1". I remember looking up to DJ. So I tell you, and in going into high school, I was 5'11". I hadn't even hit a growth spur yet. I made the freshman team, the B team, I made the sophomore team the next year, and I said, my hope, my, I'm, I was getting better. I grew, I started getting the dunk, and I'm like, yo, my, I think I'm over my head. Like, this school, we number two in the state. 
the guys on Vars, they get mailed this stick. I'm seeing Mike Shaw, who's on LeBron's uh, student athlete documentary, he get mailed from USC, all the big schools, Florida. They sending him shoes and NBA players send him stuff. And I'm just observing. I say, Ma, I think I want to transfer to a public school, to a public high school. And this was when AAU was around. So, dude, when I say when I started to take basketball serious, my grandpa passed away. Because I was like around 14. I was at my first high school before I transferred. And I was playing with the Illinois Spartans. That was my first AAU team. It was one of those teams like the parents all had to put in money. We had to fundraise. And we actually went to nationals in Florida. I played with Walt Lemon Jr. He was a dog. He's an NBA player, a current NBA guy. He was a lefty. And when he came to my team, we went to Florida. Yo, I really saw kids who was way better than me. Like, this had to be probably freshman, sophomore year of high school. Somewhere around the 15U, 16U circuit. And I'm like, yo, what's going on? Because at this point, I started to be better than people in my neighborhood. You know, I'm freshman, sophomore high school. I'm starting to catch up. The guys who was in my neighborhood that was real good, they had stopped playing. They either probably started smoking weed all the time or joining games, whatever. They just stopped moving. And I'm like the lone one left. Like, I'm still at it. Me and Ricardo, he was at Hills, another Catholic school. Winner. So I realized when I started to take the game serious, I asked my mom to transfer. So going into my junior year, I transferred to a public school called Urban Prep Charter Academy. And coming from the powerhouse I was at at De La Salle, my confidence was just way up here. So Urban Prep, this is the public league in Chicago. And we did good. We had a real good team. Coach Farrell, he was somebody that believed in me. He never took the ball out of my hand. Like, he took me from being under that basket. Like, that whole, oh, you're tall, you're a big man. Nah, he let me, like, be a guard dribble uh, from Urban Prep. And we was hooping, man. He, had, he, he would have us playing against like Lake Forest Academy, which is a prep school up north. Uh, he, he would really try to give us a tough schedule and he really exposed me to like Alex Dragovich. She went on to play at Notre Dame. Uh, my first varsity game, I gotta tell the story. My first varsity game in high school at Urban Prep was against Anthony Davis. This one, Anthony Davis was 6'4". He was 6'4", he was slow, he was dribbling, he was shooting. I was guarding him, he gave us 42 points. I had 26 points, and we won. We beat his school, he went to perspective. It was a Thanksgiving tournament. It's so my junior year, we beat him. Hey, he was a sophomore, I believe, because he was 2011. I was class of 2010, that's right. So, playing against him, Ryan Boatwright, who would later went on to UConn and play and win a national championship, we played him in one of those like Thanksgiving or Christmas tournaments. Starting to see better competition made me hungry. Cause I said, wait a minute. Is it cause these kids have dads at home working them out? Well, they paying for trainers. Like how are they getting this much better? Why they dunking so easy? How they got the perfect shot for them? You know what I'm saying? I'm starting to realize, okay, this basketball thing is wide open. It's not about who you know. People putting in that work. And that was, I've been putting in work since. I fell in love with the process. I really fell in love with the work basketball required, the, the burning of the lungs, um, the, 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 the five spot shooting, and gotta make at least eight out of 10. It became a daily mental challenge for me, feeling myself getting stronger and dunk at will. That became something that's like, like I like the feeling of when you playing against your homies or, or, or different teams and they see like, yeah, you've been working. That started to become something that I, I crave that, that uh, not even like notoriety, but just like to impose your will on somebody because they ain't been working like you. That became something I love. I, 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 I love the, the, the competitive part of it. I'm a competitor and that's just something I can't even like hide. That's why I'm still that's why I'm 30 years old and I still want to play basketball. Like, no matter what other success I've had, I still want to play the NBA. Like, I got this falling ball. I know it Wilson now, but this still in me. And it's like nothing I can do about it. So.
it's really cool and interesting now how kids have access to online programs and so many venues to get better. Whereas, like, I remember when basketball changed and it became about shooting. You know, Steph Curry basically ruined the game. Like, basically, right after the Derrick Rose era, the dominant, you know, athletic guard era, it literally changed into a game that was about being a knockdown shooter. So I remember in 2013 telling myself, yo, I got to get a wicked jump shot. I remember just going to the gym trying to make a thousand shots, literally, summer after summer, until I realized, oh, it's about quality. It's not about the quantity of shots. It's about form shooting. It's about really buckling in on my form and muscle memory. And to the point now, where I know I'm a knockdown shooter. It's evident. I've had workouts where I'm getting eight in a row, nine in a row, 13 in a row. And it's like all mental. It's like put the ball in the hole. Put it in. It's not luck. It's not a coincidence. It's a science. My footwork, my setup, my balance. You do these things right, it has to go in. It has to go in when you do the right things, preparing the shot before you catch the ball, et cetera, follow through. It has to go in. So I thank Steph Curry, I mean, for ruining the, ruining in the game, they say. Because now basketball, is, it's a lot more played like in Europe. Like, you know, over there when I was in Europe, I realized and I witnessed kids could shoot at 14, 13. Why kids in the hood, we got the crossover, the dunk. We, nah. But why the, why the hell can we make a jump shot in inner cities? Why is that the last thing we learn? And I look at it, and I mean, I tie it back into having fathers in the house. Literally, I tie it back to some of the most micro things. You know, you look at someone's lifestyle, discipline, the, the monotony of routine, the monk-like mentality of doing things over and over with purpose. Those are the ingredients that makes a great shooter. In this particular combine right here, I just remember we was in COVID and I had to use what I had available to prepare myself getting conditioned. Running stairs in my apartment building, you know, one on zero skill work because a lot of people were quarantining and keeping their distance. So it was pretty, it was difficult to prepare for this combine. It's one of those combines I didn't have months to prepare for, but because I stayed ready in the pandemic, I didn't have to like hurry myself up, or speed myself up to get ready and hurry up and get in shape. I pretty much stayed in shape the entire pandemic. And I actually received a, a couple of offers from this combine. Um, having my daughter born May in 2020, I decided to not go to Russia and play. Had a team in the Russian Super League looking at me. And received some G League interest but that year we didn't get an offer so I decided to stay local and I actually played with the Red Rose Thunder which is a uh, semi-pro type of kind of league you know obviously it's a step below the G League but it gave me an outlet to you know get some game reps and stay in game shape and so I'm forever grateful for the opportunity.
I put it to you like this. Sometimes life shows you the most weird coincidences or synchronicities. I remember the summer before Kobe passed. It was day 81 in my diary journal. And I remember going to the Nike factory. And I'm like, hmm, day 81, I'm writing. I'm going to the factory. And they're like, yeah, we only got one Kobe shoe left. It just so happened to be my size. And it was the, the colorway that he scored 81 points in weird and so fast forward he obviously passed that year on my mother's birthday on the 26th i was in a slump i hadn't been shooting for a while and i decided to go to the gym the next day on the 27th after he passed and the news just so happened to come that day and it was like hey you look like kobe and you got on his shoes can we talk to you so i thought that was a cool way to kind of mourn his death a little bit aspiring to be pro player wore his kobe nikes that's why i'm wearing the shoes right now just wearing his shoes. yeah these are the shoes he had on when he scored 81 points ricky goings has seen many of the kids he's coached here at dc go on to play at universities a few to the nba he said he has used kobe as a role model how hard he worked uh, he put he put his effort in he listened he worked hard and most importantly, we always were saying, go forward. His colleague agrees. It's not just about sports. It's not just about exercise. It's about life lessons. So that's what we want to teach. That was his message. Hard work and dedication. And be the best as you can be. Still, the news was hard. I couldn't sleep last night. It felt like he was going to wake up and hopefully, hopefully it was fake. You know, hoping that that was a, a bad dream or something. Of course, it was not a dream for I always thought it was funny when players ask, are we going to run sprints today? Are we going to do the hard stuff today? And those are the rookies, right? Because on my player development journey, I realized that's what I'm looking for. I'm looking for the pain. I'm looking every time I work with a new trainer, I'm trying to discover what kind of pain do you have available? What do you have that's going to make me scratch my head and ask myself, damn, do I really want to play this game? Do I really want to be as good as I say I'm going to be? And sometimes those are the best workouts when it's like, it's not based off of feeling good and going at it half speed. It's like, nah, we in here 45, 90 minutes hard. Th those are the dog days that really get us better. Once I realized that on my basketball journey that it was like literally a mountain and I don't have to look and find the top of it. I don't gotta worry about how tall this mountain is. I just need to focus on getting 1% better every day, taking one step forward. That's when everything changed for me.